got strong views around that, right? I think one of the downsides of being able to do it more easily than you could before is that we're exposing more people to the risk of picking stocks individually, right? And, um, you know, the funniest thing is, right, and Ducky, you say that it's actually a profession. It is a profession. And there are people who are experienced and doing this on a day-to-day basis. They, you know, perform, you know, lots and lots of research and then they make a stock decision on the basis of that. But the truth is that even those professionals themselves don't get it right. You know, there's a, you know, I, I talked about the, you know, the, the investors who are dead are uh, outperforming active managers um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the, on the U.S. stock exchange over the last, I can't remember the period, right? I'm, I'm going to be misquoting that. But if we just look at the most recent experience, the COVID crisis, right? There was a study that was done by Morningstar where they found that, um, you know, sure, I, I'll be misquoting the percentage again, but the majority of active managers so people who get up in the morning, whose job it is to perform the research and choose the stocks, they underperformed the index. And the difference between the active managers, so these guys who are investment professionals who are choosing the shares and the index is that the index is based on a fixed formula and it's investing in all the shares in the market on the basis of this fixed formula. So these index funds, which are purely form- following this fixed formula, outperformed the active managers. And if you think that these professionals are being outperformed by this fixed formula, it just goes to show how the rest of us who are not in the investment industry are on a hiding to nothing if we try and do that ourselves. You know, so it really is difficult. And, and then, if, you know, we come back to behavioral science, which I talked about a bit earlier on. As human beings, we're so also driven by emotion. And what tends to happen when you're stock picking and making these decisions on the basis of emotion is you'll buy high and you'll sell low. And that's the worst time to be um, buy, you know, buying shares because if you're buying high, you're buying it expensive because you think the market is gonna run. You think about your Bitcoin example that you used and the Bitcoin market was running, oh man, we all wanted to jump on that train and that was yeah. going up the train. And then as soon as that uh, train went down, everybody started to sell. But most people sold at the wrong time. So they bought expensive and they sold cheap and they made a loss. Um, and that's one of the biggest risks with, with picking stocks specifically. What you should be rather doing is investing in diversified shares, which are called exchange traded funds or ETFs. And those shares, if you buy that share, that one share already gives you exposure to the entire, um, to a series of shares that yeah. gives you what we call diversification. And that's like a simple, you know, that's a simple way of doing it, right? Buying a simple, um, a uh, diversified share or investing in, in a, a tracking and an index tracking unit trust. I mean, I know I'm going into terminology here and jargon, yeah. but you get unit trusts which track um, a series of shares on the basis of a fixed formula. Those are called index tracking unit trusts. And then you've got what's called an exchange traded fund, which is one share, but it's actually tracking the performance of multiple shares. So it gives you that diversification. You're not just investing in one time airlines, you're investing in a series of different companies. And if one time airlines happens to go default, that's okay because the rest of your investment is actually invested in a series of other companies. So this fundamental rule of picking something that's diversified and is not really at risk of human emotion or impacts of human emotion is one way to overcome that problem. Just to hand over to T. This means that this reinforces really what we all been trying to discuss, which is to really grow financially uh, and uh, uh, do well in the long term is to really take care of the basics and not to try and pick one shooting star, which is virtually impossible. uh, Therefore, we all need to really work on managing our finances properly. And the key principle really is starting with the amount of money that you currently have and seeing what you're actually doing with this teeth. 100%. I think that's true. And, and um, you know, one lovely thing that I'm picking up just even from um, having, having this conversation with you um, is within art, we've got a, the philosophy of minimalism. Um, are, you, are you familiar with, with minimalists and, um, yeah, within the field? Would you, would you consider yourself that because it seems like a, 
it almost seems like an overlying principle with with um, how you <laughs> yeah with how with how you approach things. Would you consider yourself a minimalist? Yeah, I, look, I, I'm a sure. So I mean, the other thing that I really am passionate about is the climate, right? And um, the impact that the climate, the climate, yeah. So the impact okay. that okay. consumerism is actually ha- having on our on our climate. You know, the the more stuff we buy, um, the more we use as a human race, the more uh, unsustainable the planet becomes for all of us to live on, right? And I know we all have our, we each have our own challenges, and and that's absolutely fine, you know. Um, but for me, one of the things that drives my, I guess you could call it quote unquote minimalism is, um, this, this care for making sure that when I buy something, I actually really, really need it because of the potential negative impacts that that thing that I'm buying has on the environment, you know, um, you know, we've stopped this thing where we now buy Christmas gifts for people without asking them what they want for Christmas, you know? We stop this thing where we buy birthday gifts for people without asking them what they really need. Because I don't like this idea of just buying stuff for people that they're not going to actually use or find value in. And I'd yeah. rather also, you know, instead of buying material things, buy experiences for people. Because those experiences, um, you know, I, I guess in most cases are, are, are things that people will enjoy more. But also in some cases or most cases will actually be better for the environment than buying a material good. Uh, so, you know, but, you know, if we remove all of that, right, around the environment, my philosophy is, you know, spend money on the things that bring you joy. You know, the, it's the things that make you happy. And, you know, what we tend to do in, a, in our day-to-day or our month-to-month spending is we don't actually uh, buy the things that bring us joy. We buy the, and when I say joy, I mean long-term life joy. Live your best life because you're actually achieving those long-term those big, big outcomes that you want to achieve as an individual. And what we tend to do is we start looking for short-term satisfaction. And that could be, you know, going out with my friends and blowing thousands of rands at the bar. But actually the following day, there's like, you know, um, there's a buyer or spender's remorse because it brought you short-term joy for that night. But actually your long-term goal is you maybe want to go on holiday and you're better off putting that money towards a holiday. Or you want to buy a car and you're better off putting that money towards a car. And that's why, you know, when you're spending your money, it's about thoughtful spending uh, and spending on things that actually bring you joy. And minimalism for me is a function of that. So when I make a decision, I'm thinking about, okay, if, it, if it's going to impact the environment, it's going to bring me less joy. So I actually factor that into the decision that I make when I'm actually buying something. I buy the things that I, I really need and will make me happy. happy. In our discussions with our listeners, uh, one of the most disheartening and concerning things that we we may, we bumped into was that, especially in the art and uh, self-employed uh, type of sector, people do not really, first of all, understand where their money is going. Uh, they do not uh, check their bank statements. This is one of the key things that people we realized and it was shocking when I was discussing with other artists that. <laughs> They actually do not review their bank statements at least once a month, uh, which leads to the point that they actually do not know where their hard-earned money is going. Teeth, since season one, are you checking your bank statements? Bro, I'm, I'm, I'm hard out here. I'm hard out here. I think, um, so yeah, when we did this kind of episode in season one, I remember it was a revelation for me where our um, guest Kuda, he did like our first uh, episode, Kuda Samkange, and he he spoke about um, just check your bank statement once a month, you know. Um, and I was like, what? How? When? At what time? And I, I could say that I, I, I won't necessarily once a month, but definitely w- I do know what my statement looks like at least every two months. And if I can have a standard of once a month, I'm being honest. But I think... A simple principle like that for me has just been like life changing. Did you hear what he said, uh, Jiku? He said, how, when, when do I get the time? That's where your automation principle comes in. And this is where uh, the application 22.7 really comes in. Please tell us a bit about uh, the app. J- just, just hold on, just hold on, please. Shouldn't we do an ad break before? Oh yeah, uh, Jigo, let's, we, let's, let's. since we're trying to get paid here, we have uh, <laughs> ad breaks that actually do not exist. <laughs> but either way, guys, we're taking uh, 
a minute of ad breaks where we're going to sell products you're not going to buy. But nonetheless, we'll be right back. <laughs>